Okay, so let's wrap up this lecture. Apologize for it not quite wrapping up in class, but I needed to be deliberate enough to make sure that that I did address everything properly, uh, because you know, as I was implying, these are pretty important issues, particularly because this relates to how the fossil record can actually inform us about what happens with climate change events on the scale that we're seeing now. As I mentioned in class, the estimated amount of warming that we're going to see if we if you follow the business as usual model, uh, that is we don't do massive decarbonization of our industry now, basically, this century, this decade rather, not this century, this decade, um, then, then we have to look back into Earth history to look at what what are some good models that would give us a suggestion of the scale of the changes we would see? And is the PETM a good model? Well, the amount of warming is very comparable as the business as usual model versus what happened at the PETM, something like five to seven degrees centigrade rise above the conditions beforehand. But there are some differences. For instance, the rate of warming going on now is actually vastly faster than it was at the PETM. So on this diagram, it's a little dated here. Uh, it showed the rise of the PETM at um, up to 1.7 petagrams, that's gigatons, of carbon per year, as opposed to the present day when it's 25 gigatons, 25 petagrams of carbon per year. Um, now, there are some more recent studies, and this figure was made, that actually put the slope for the PETM even lower at 0.58 petagrams, that is gigatons of carbon per year, so that'd be like about half that. So it took much longer to go from preconditions to the full warming than we're seeing. That makes some sort of sense, you know, we have an industry that keeps on ramping up when it can, so it's a lot of emissions. The human population is growing. The amount of people who live in the industrialized world is growing because more and more countries industrialize. Um, and therefore, the rate is very, very fast. Whereas, you know, the volcanoes can only go so fast and the melting of the sea ice can only go so fast in the past. So that's one difference. Um, and so here's a look at, uh, again, a slightly outdated figure because we are indeed, you know, at 2020 or so. How long will it be? before we reach the levels that were present in the atmosphere at the PETM? Well, depending upon the model of the amount of carbon that had been introduced into the atmosphere at the PETM, maybe it's not until the middle of the next century or late in the century after that, the 23rd century. So it's going to take some time, even at our rates, to get to the amount of emissions. But still, you know, maybe not in our lifetime, but within our civilization's lifetime. But let's think more broadly about the comparison. The PETM had a similar amount of warming, but it started from a, a warming from a warmer condition. That is, the Paleocene time was a greenhouse world. Remember I talked about greenhouse versus ice house? Well, the, the Paleocene was a greenhouse world, so it's starting from warm and taking it even warmer. In contrast, the beginning of the Anthropocene, so the time before the Industrial Revolution, we were in an interglacial, in an ice age world. So most of human history is in, written human history, is within an interglacial in the cycles between glacials and interglacials. So we started from a lower condition. Also, the gases that are controlling it are different. Not that it makes a big difference. Anthropocene warming is mostly from CO2. PETM is mostly from CH4. Now, a CH4, that is methane molecule, is a stronger greenhouse gas molecule for molecule, but it's a much shorter um, duration, residence time in the atmosphere. That said, when CH4 breaks down, it breaks down into water, which then rains out, and CO2. So it really isn't that big a difference there. As I said, the rate of increase is much faster than the pulses that were involved in the PETM as stuff was degassing from the seafloor. But the total release seems to be comparable, something on the order of five gigatons of carbon. Uh, that's the business as usual model. The PETM, you know, the brackets are large, but they encompass that value. And because the surrounding Earth system is similar, 
the total duration of the event would be similar. That is, eventually, we would stop emitting carbon into the atmosphere, whether it's due to the collapse of our civilization or the fact that we run out of fossil fuels and we're not emitting, you know, carbonization. We are, de our, our, our society is decarbonized automatically when we don't have the option of any more coal or any more petroleum. There's limited resources. We eventually run out. Um, and so then the atmosphere starts resorbing that excess CO2. And it will do that eventually. The Earth will clear its system out, just not at scales that are useful to you and I or our civilization. It takes tens to hundreds of thousands of years for the natural system to remove that much greenhouse gas that's been introduced in the atmosphere. So when we look at the PETM, well, first of all, here's the emissions going into our future, a couple different models into the future. So we get this warming, you know, bracketing around five degrees for the business as usual model. If we have an all-out increase, uh, all-out decrease of decarbonization and so forth, then we're like maxing out about two degrees. Of course, it wouldn't necessarily stop then. Uh, if the business as usual model could actually continue, it's not like it's reached an asymptote. Um, so we could could take the levels up back to the way the way they were, you know, in the Paleogene, that is the Paleocene, Eocene, and Oligocene, or before. And Here's the big thing. So here's the pulse of extra carbon released into the atmosphere. It eventually peters out, regardless of whether it's our, under our control or not. This is like it's not under our control. We've used it all up. It stays in the atmosphere for many, many, many thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And the PETM gives us our model. It looks like the interval when the environment had shifted before that CO2, methane and CO2, was absorbed back into the system, was on the scale of just about 100,000 years. So let's say we max out in our greenhouse warming in 2200. Well, then in the year 120,200, so unimaginably far into the future, that's when the stuff that's been introduced from the Anthropocene finally all gets resorbed into the Earth system. And this is part of the problem that I think policymakers have, and the public as, as a whole, is the public as a whole does not appreciate the geologic time scale. And I don't mean the history of the Earth per se, I mean the scale that things happen. A hundred thousand years is a blip on the geologic time scale. It is an instantaneous event, essentially, for most of the stuff we're looking at. But from the point of view of our lives, that's vastly longer than all of written human history. All of written human history, from the first cuneiform tablets in Sumeria to today, is only about 6,000 years. So things which are essentially eternal, as far as human civilization is concerned, are a blip in Earth history. Yeah, the Earth will clean itself up, We'll clean up our mess, but not at a stage that's useful to us. So we better to act now and not have to rely on that, because that's not relying on anything. That means things are going to be horrible for the rest of human existence. So when the environment changes a lot, how does it respond? Well, it depends upon how quickly it happens. And this is comparing sort of the scale that things happen. If there's sufficient time, if the changes go slowly enough, life evolves to respond. If it's changing slowly enough, you can get the differential sorting of variance in a population, and it adapts to the new condition. If it's moderately placed, paced, if it's at ecological time, then you can actually get migration events going on. And we see that to a certain degree today. More equatorial animals and plants are moving into the temperate zone. And we'll see later on in the course how creatures that were adapted to the cold environment on the Tibetan plateau moved out to become the common animals of the polar region during the ice ages, during glacials. But if, like the PETM, or the events we'll talk about in the next couple weeks, the mass extinction events, if the environment switches too fast then it's either extinction or survival. It's the Game of Thrones. You either win or you die. And that indeed will be the subject of the next three lectures. We'll be examining the greatest environmental crises in the Phanerozoic, that is, 
the great mass extinction events. Take care, see you in class, good luck on the exam, and I will see you later.